Stanford University. Okay, glass, surgical safety checklist. We're gonna go ahead and do a timeout check. This patient's name is John Doe, check. We're gonna be doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, check. The patient is in a supine position, check. This is the correct operative side, check. Consent is signed and present in the operating room. It has been signed by the patient and by myself, check. The site does not need to be marked in this case and is visible. Check. This patient received two grams of ANSEF given in the waiting room at 1045. Check. He also got 5,000 units of soft heparin in the waiting room, and he has SEDs that are on and running in both lower extremities. Check. This patient has no known drug allergies. Check. This procedure should take about 45 minutes to an hour. Check. The estimated blood loss is less than 20 cc's. Check. There is no need for blood products. Check. Uh, we have the cholangiogram C arm ready. Check. There is no need for implants. Check. No need for other special equipment. Check. And we really have no unexpected or critical steps. Check. Uh, this patient concern is that he is HIV positive. Check. We all agreed to proceed with this surgery. Check. My name is Homero Rivas, and I'm the surgeon. Check. So, Homero Rivas. So, Homero Rivas, tell us about your experience with uh, Google Glass as a surgeon at Stanford, Very briefly. Good. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it's been fascinating. Uh, we have... Uh, a number of projects that we have with Google Glass. As you can imagine, uh, there is a sky's the limit. And I should mention, uh, Denise, you, you, you mentioned how lots of people are trying to implement uh, artificial intelligent engines. And uh, Larry Chu is actually one of the pioneers in this. And they have a group at Stanford now. They're implementing all those artificial intelligent engines into Glass so you can actually get uh, checklists that are populated by artificial intelligence for that matter. Uh, with no question, this is something we have an IRB. This is an ethical uh, review board where we are comparing patients that we can do through a checklist populated by glass versus just the memory that uh, surgeons would have. The adherence of using checklists in healthcare in the operating rooms is very high already. However, most people who do a checklist is a very poor quality checklist. They just say, okay, my name is such and such, let's go ahead timeouts ready, and that's, that's about it. Uh, in this case, you actually have to go through all the items, and you can get a recording of this that you, in, at, you know, at some point, you can implement it to the uh, medical record. But today at Stanford, I imagine that it's not yet, that this was sort of experimental, right? Of course, this is experimental, and this is something that we initiated first in the simulation lab, and now we're bringing into the operating theater as we have now that uh, IRB. Would uh, Stanford need proof that using this is significantly better than not using it? Uh, yes, and, and I have to admit, uh, you were asking Marlies if uh, Dutch surgeons were going to wait until this would be okay. Well, interestingly, I believe innovation happens before outside the U.S. We actually in the U.S. can give you lots of technologies and devices and implement many things. However, in healthcare, we're extremely risk averse. And we have to have scientific data with prospective randomized trials because before we can implement it into the masses. I think that's fascinating because Omero is at Stanford, as you know, that Stanford is sort of the home to Silicon Valley. The reason why so many of the new ventures take place in Silicon Valley is that they were originally offshoots from Stanford students financed by Stanford. And to hear him say it is true. that they are traditional in healthcare in Stanford gives hope that Europe can be one of the leaders. When it comes to the schools of engineering, when it comes to other schools, certainly everything is mixed with industry and the schools. But when it comes to the school of medicine, 
we're extremely classical in our approach and we have to have scientific data that is conflict free of interest. So, so what I find really interesting is that I was thinking more of a nothing to something. I was thinking of checklist. I happen to know that there's a lot of difficulty. There are surgeons who really, as you said, just it, checklist, yes, I'm Dr. Silber. Um, but what you're saying is that it's very subtle. Actually, there may be surgeons doing all levels of checklist, and yeah. the only way to do the 100% uh, ideal checklist would be to have it generated by artificial intelligence for e each case e exactly. and to go through it. And the other thing is you need to remember that we train lots of new surgeons uh, who would be uh, perhaps not as experienced as savvy when it comes to doing a checklist. This goes beyond the operating room and it goes pretty much in all aspects, uh, all areas of healthcare. And uh, do you have any opinion o about um when? Do you think that this is going to happen at Stanford, and do you have any pre prediction about how long it might take? I think it's going to take a long time, honestly, mm -hmm. at Stanford, just because I, I know how things work. Uh, but I, I do see that this will be implemented. What, what, what needs to happen is that this needs to be economically viable for the masses. Uh, right now, at, at a retail price of $1,500, I don't think this could be universally adopted. But just once you have other wearables from other companies, then you will have economies of scale, and this will be adopted massively. You don't think Google would outfit Stanford at a really low price just to have that symbol? I, I, th I don't think so. I, well, maybe through a donation or something, but it's, uh, it's not that easy. There's, there's, as I said, lots of, thing, lots of people who are risk averse, and they still worry about, like, HIPAA compliance and those things, even though uh, there's really no patient information that is being given through this checklist. Now, you're very busy as a surgeon. Yes. When do you find the time to work on these experimental things? Well, do we just make time. I believe I'm someone who believes that the more projects you have, the more uh, efficient you become with your practice. Uh, you just have to. Okay, well, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh -huh.